We're somebody different than we used to be. And there's a joy, there's a wonderful excitement about that. And Paul says, Bless, praise God who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I've got to say one thing about that before we move on, and we are going to move on. Blessed be God, praise God, who's blessed us. That's the grace way. The grace way says, he blessed me. He blessed us. Look at what I've received from him. How can I do less than love him? You see, the grace way is that, is that he blesses us, and we bless him in response. We praise him. We don't praise him to get his approval. We don't bless him to get him to take notice of us. We see the great things he's done for us. Grace, all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you run the race and fail, he didn't. I'll tell you that verse in Romans 5, through the disobedience of one, I know that guy, but it was through the obedience of one many are made righteous. Not my obedience, but his. Now what does that do? When I see his blessings upon me, does that mean I just, you know, the idea is you teach that to people and they'll just go out and live in sin. I was doing that already. Was pretty good at it, by the way. His grace came and changed all that. Took away my sin and gave me life. It doesn't make for careless living. It doesn't make for passivity. Self does that. That's the self life. The grace life is Christ in you, Him becoming your life, and it's all and it's something exciting. Now, I want to go through the rest of the verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I've struggled about how to teach that verse, and I thought, well, why don't you just teach it the way it comes? What an idea. <laughs> All the homiletical books would go out of business if people did that, wouldn't they? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Notice the character and the extent of our blessings. All spiritual blessings. First notice their, the character. They're spiritual. Now, it, that, that at once brings you into two different emphasis. And by the way, when you hear Bible teachers and read commentaries, they, they, for some reason they pick one or the other of these, and, and, and I'm, I'm reading them, so duh, it's not one or the other, it's both. Because when it says it's spiritual, one, he's talking about the region in which our blessings reside. They are spiritual blessings. If you look over at chapter 3, verse number 16, you'll get the emphasis here. Chapter 3, verse 16. Paul's praying for the, Philippians, uh, the Ephesians. That, he would, that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit, where? In the inner man. You see, the, the region, the realm in which our blessings reside is in our inner man. That's where they're called spiritual blessings. They don't reside in our flesh, in our self-life. They reside in who God has made, this new creature God has made us in Christ. They're, they're in, this is an inner man operation. But it also talks about the medium by which they're conferred upon you. Because they are spiritual. That is, they are imparted to you by the Holy Spirit. Notice the verse again, 3.16. We're strengthened with might, how? By His Spirit. Not by the preacher. Not by the priest. Not by your activity. But by the working of God the Holy Ghost in your inner man. You see, these blessings that we have are not the outer things. They're the inner things. If, if, hold your hand and come over to Colossians chapter 2. When you talk about religion, one of the great places to go in your thinking 
to keep it properly adjusted is Colossians 2. Because in Colossians 2 verse 10, you have the counterpart, the sister verse. You know, Colossians and Ephesians are sister epistles. There are dozens and dozens of places in Ephesians and Colossians that are almost mirror images of one another. It's crazy. It's crazy like wonderful crazy, not crazy like dumb, okay? It's, it's wonderful. I, I, I've, I've, sat, I've spent exciting hours. I, you could do this. Instead of sitting around wondering what to do with yourself tomorrow afternoon, take Ephesians and read it six or eight times, then take Colossians and read it six or eight times, and then go back and start reading Ephesians and start noticing the places you remember that were in Colossians. And you know what? You'll fill up a piece of notebook paper. And by the way, it'll be better for you than anything you watched on TV or read in the newspaper or did at the gym or on the ball field. I wouldn't say work because you've got to go to work, but all that other... You know what it'll do? It'll begin to transform the way you think about some of these things. Well, a sister verse to Ephesians 1.3 is Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Look how complete he was, or is, verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything God is is in him. <laughs> bodily. That is available for you and me. Because he's not just the God who lives away out yonder. He's also the man, Christ Jesus. He takes God by the one hand because he's God. He takes man by the hand because he's man and brings us together. And he's the mediator, the go-between, the daysman, the place of meeting between God and man. It's a wonderful thing. That's an exciting thing. And you're complete in him. How could you be any completer than being complete in the one who is God? Fully God, truly God, undiminished deity, and yet fully and completely and totally man. Tempted in all points like you are, yet without sin. He ran your race successfully when you didn't. That's a wonderful thing. And you're complete in him. There's nothing, you know, we want to be complete. We want to be fulfilled. There's nothing. There's nowhere to be fulfilled completely, totally, with no gaps, like in him. Now, verse 11. In whom? Also, when Paul says these things, he begins to tell you about some of them. In whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision, notice, made without hands. That means no human did it. Well, if a human didn't do it and it was done, who did it? Verse, verse uh, 12. Buried with him by baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through faith of the, there it is, Operation of God, who hath raised us from the dead. Now notice, circumcision and baptism, those are two of the great religious rites. Neither one of them, both of which you have today, by the way, but neither one of them have anything to do with what a preacher did to you or have anything to do with your outer man. There's a circumcision made without hands. Well, there's a circumcision in the Bible in the flesh made with hands, Ephesians 2.12. That's Israel's program. You and I have a circumcision that sets us apart from our old man, had nothing to do with anything, anybody. God did it for you. You see, these are all spiritual blessings. These are things that, are, that, that reside in your inner man and that are imparted to you by the operation of God himself. This isn't something you have to achieve or that you could achieve if you had to. Ephesians 1.3. So he's blessed you with all spiritual blessings. Uh, you're in Ephesians 1. Go back to Galatians chapter 3 just for a second. Here, here's a verse and I want you to get a hold of here. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. All these blessings in our inner man that the Spirit of God is going to produce. We're strengthened by His Spirit. There's the medium. In our inner man, that's the place of His operating and working in me. Galatians 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Now, he says that because people get confused about this because instead of just listening to what God says, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. Somebody comes along and tries to cast a religious spell on you and think, it isn't enough just to have this 
non-physical thing happen to me that I didn't even sense and feel. You know the old saying, a man with an experience is more powerful than a man with a, with a testimony or, or with, a, with, with a doctrine. That's why when they try to sell you something, one of the most powerful things in sales are testimonials. In fact, I saw recently was saw uh, some uh, some I was looking at some software, computer software on the internet for sale, trying to find some stuff to do some work with. And one of the complaints, this is a new package just put out, and one of the complaints that was laid against it is there were no testimonials. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, the guy could go to Fiverr and you know for five bucks get thirty people to write him a testimonial. That, what's the test? I don't believe the testimonials anyway. Do you? You do. Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, if I was the guy, I'd get some friends to write me some testimonials. That's what the, you know. Anyway, experience is more powerful than just the sales presentation. Well, it's that way in religion. You know how many people, the way in 1 Timothy 4 when he says that, some, that, that the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. How? giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what do the seducing spirits do? A seducer is someone who draws you away from what's right with the promise of some physical ecstasy, some physical delight, some experience. And if I can point you to experienced-based reality, I can draw you away from doctrinal-based reality. But where does the spirit work? What kind of blessings are there? They're spiritual blessings. They're not operating in your emotions. They're not operating in your outer man. They're operating in your inner man. Now, if they operate in your inner man, they can work out through your body. But they don't work out through your body because that's where they come from. That is a result. And whether that result happens or not, the reality is what the Spirit of God's doing in your inner man. Oh, foolish Galatians, they'd been bewitched by getting people to make them look at the flesh, their physical activity, and trust what they physically could perform. So he, he corrects them, verse 3. And the way he corrects them is ask them questions. Paul was trying always to get you to think. Not just in, you know, lecture you, but get you to think. Think about what you know about who you are in Christ. Oh, foolish Galatians. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having, now no, under, circle that next word, will you? Begun in the Spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? If you began the Christian life in the Spirit, what do you think your flesh is going to add to the perfection that God provided? Now, if you keep that in mind, you can get over the hump of religion you can get over the hump of performance-based acceptance ideology, the idea that if I do these things, God will be happier with me, and if I do, to do this, God will bless me, and if I don't, he'll withhold. You can get over that. What I want you to see is that word, begun. Where does the Christian life begin? Having begun, say it, in the Spirit. The Christian life begins with you being blessed that instant with all spiritual blessings. You follow that? Man, that's good. <laughs> this is not something you achieve. This is where you start in the Christian life. You start at the top of the ladder. You're not at the bottom with, with ten rungs to climb. 